If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try to solve the question on your own before listening on. In order to solve this question, what we're actually going to do to make the problem solving easier is to shift our y and x axis. So let's draw a picture to show what we mean by that. So we're going to call this line right here the x axis and then the other line will be our y axis. And it turns out that that selection of axes will make our problem easier. Once we accept that, and we'll see why that turns out to be easier, hopefully, as we solve the problem. Once we accept that shift in axes, why don't we go ahead and actually just sort of rotate our picture so that our x and y axis are in their normal orientation. And what we've done is drawn only one of the circular arcs because it's just turn, it just turns out to be easier to analyze the problem by showing one of them. What we're about to say for this first circular arc will hold true for the second circular arc as well as the third circular arc. We just won't draw them again because it would sort of clutter up the drawing. Now, let's consider a small slice, if you will, of the circular arc. And because it's so small, we would have a very tiny amount of charge located at that slice. And that charge is typically denoted as dq. And that tiny amount of charge would have a quantity equal to a linear charge density times a very tiny length. And hopefully that makes sense. Remember that a linear charge density would be measured in coulombs per meter. And then a very tiny length along the circular arc would be measured in meters. And if we cancel out the units, we would be left with just coulombs, which is indeed the correct unit for charge. And it turns out that this tiny amount of charge would be producing an electric field. Now, the first circular arc is a positive charge, and positive charges produce electric fields that point away from the positive charge. So there would be an electric field vector pointing in this direction here. Now, because it's produced by a tiny amount of charge, we, we would have a very tiny amount of electric field, which is typically denoted as dE. And we know that dE would equal k, multiplied by dq divided by r squared. And since we said that dq is equal to lambda times ds, we can make a substitution there. Now, because of the symmetry of the situation, we would have on the other side of the circular arc another differential amount of charge, dq. And that too would be producing an electric field pointing away from that charge. And hopefully if we study this diagram carefully, we can see that the x component and the y component of that differential charge can be drawn as follows. And the same is true for the x and y component of the differential charge in the red color that we originally started with. If we look at that carefully, we can see that the y components will actually cancel each other out because one y component points up and the other points down. So in essence, we only have to consider the x components of these electric fields. Now, if we extend an imaginary line from the origin to that first differential charge, we would have an angle that we could symbolize as theta. And because this angle here is vertical to it, that too would be theta. Remember, we're only considering the x components of these electric fields. So we can see from the diagram that this x component would be adjacent to that angle. And therefore, the electric field of that x component would be the electric field times the cosine of the angle theta, since this is adjacent to the electric field component. So in other words, we have to come over here and add cosine theta to our differential electric field expression. Now, again, that red expression is the electric field produced by just this tiny amount of charge. We, of course, want the total electric field by produced by the entire circular arc, which means we're going to have to integrate this expression. The only challenge here is that we have two variables. We have theta as well as s. Well, it turns out that there's a nice relationship between ds and theta, and it's equal to the following equation. That might be familiar from a geometry course where you may have studied that the arc length is equal to a radius multiplied by some angle measured in radians. We don't have an entire arc length here. We're just looking at a very tiny differential arc length, so we have ds, but it's basically the same expression. If we have ds, we're going to have d theta instead of just theta. So we're going to go ahead and substitute for ds the expression r d theta. And what's nice about that is we now have just one variable on the right-hand side of this equation. So we're going to go ahead and integrate both sides of this equation. And in order to fully integrate this, we have to integrate from this angle 
all the way along the arc out to this angle. Going back to the original picture, we see that the circular arc was actually a quarter of a circle. So a quarter of 360 degrees, of course, is 90, which means that we're going to have to integrate from keeping this angle in total 90 degrees. We're going to have to integrate from negative 45 degrees out to positive 45 degrees. Now, when integrating this expression, we actually have some constants that can be removed from the integral. In fact, if you look carefully, you have r in the numerator and r squared in the denominator. So that, of course, can just cancel out to make r in the denominator. We can pull all those constants to the outside of the integral. Now, the left-hand side just becomes e, and the right-hand side is the integral of cos theta, which, of course, is sine theta. And then we'll go ahead and plug in the upper and lower limits. Sine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2, and sine of negative pi over 4 is negative root 2 over 2. And then if we simplify the term in the brackets, we'll just have root 2. Now, lambda, we recall, is the linear charge density. And to find that, we would have to take the entire charge, which is positive Q, and divide that by the length of this circular arc. Now, that's a quarter of a circle, so we would have 1 fourth of a full circle, which, of course, is 2 pi r. So we're left with lambda equals 2q over pi r. Let's go ahead and substitute in 2q over pi r in for lambda. And then algebraically, the pi r can be shifted to the denominator to make pi r squared. So this is the expression for the electric field produced by the first circular arc. We're going to have similar expressions for the second and third circular arcs. The only difference is that we're going to have a different value for q as well as a different value for the radius r. So let's set up the next two expressions for that second and third circular arc. So there they are. Notice the charge and radius have been changed according to the correct circular arc. The total electric field will be the sum of these three individual fields. So at this point in the problem, you could plug in all the known values, or you could notice that there's a common factor of 2 root 2 kq over pi r squared that is common to all three terms. So let's factor it out. You might want to pause the video and just make sure that that factoring makes sense to you. If it doesn't, please let me know in the comments and I'd be happy to answer it. Now we can plug in the known values for k, q, and r. Notice that q is given in microcoulombs, so you have to multiply it by 10 to the minus 6 to get it into coulombs, and then r needs to be converted to meters, which will be 0.10 meters. So let's plug in all the known values. And when you process that all down, you should get approximately 1.62 times 10 to the 6th newtons per coulomb. This is the correct answer to part A. As for the direction, recall, here is the original picture, recall that we had shifted the x-axis so that it was pointing in this fashion in order to take advantage of some of the symmetry of, of doing that. And we said that the only components that mattered were the x-components of the electric fields. And when we said x-components, we meant the x-axis that we had created. So on the x-axis that we had made, that would be pointing in this direction. But in reference to the original x-axis, that would actually be forming an angle that was 45 degrees below that x-axis, that original x-axis. So a little bit confusing, perhaps. But the correct answer for the direction will be negative 45 degrees counterclockwise from the original x-axis. And so that's the correct answer to part B. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, please click the thumbs up icon and subscribe. Also, send in your own question to this address and I'll do my best to answer it on YouTube.